In today's episode of the Back in Shape podcast, we're going to be talking all about how you can recover from lower back surgery. This episode is going to be quite detailed and is accompanied by a more lengthy than usual article on the website for some extra information, extra support, and extra clarification in certain areas. We will make reference to some of those parts as well as I go through today's episode, so do check that out if it's of interest. And I will also add, just before we get into it, this is really focused to those of you that perhaps have a surgery lined up for the lower back, maybe it's on the cards, whatever the case may be, or if you've just had one and you're looking to get back in shape properly afterwards and, and do things right this time, great, and we'll get onto that later on, that's really important. But also, many of the principles and concepts that we talk about here are going to be helpful regardless. Whether you've got a minor lower back issue, maybe you've got a recurrent lower back issue or sciatica, it's really going to hopefully give you guys that framework, that understanding that can really help you move forward successfully. So let's start out by just saying or stating the obvious specialists, surgeons, the NHS guidance all agrees that a patient who is in better physical condition will have increased odds of success from lower back surgery and any surgery, by the way, um, compared to someone who is in less favorable condition. And that is really, really important as we'll get on to a little bit later on. The better your physical condition going in, the better you're going to come out the lower chances of complications, the lower chances of relapses and repeat surgeries, and the higher probabilities of this being a turning point perhaps and a success. So that's you've got to have that in your mind going through here because a failure to acknowledge that is, re is a real frustration because we've spoke to so many people over the years clinically and we've had people reach out to us on the membership maybe in the last couple of years that they, they've got a surgery lined up and say, well, I'm not going to do anything until I've had the surgery. And this is such a categoric mistake. It really is um, problematic and it's just decreasing fundamentally your odds of success. And hopefully this will help you understand that a little bit more because that's kind of a, a, a quite a, a bold statement, but it will make sense by the time we finish this episode. So Let's start out by the important thing you need to do, and that is understand your surgery. Now, everyone's going to have different surgeries, and everyone's surgery is going to go differently. You know, it's going to, there's going to be nuances based on your specific circumstances. And understand the prospective procedures that your surgeon is proposing to you before the surgery, and understand how that surgery has gone compared to how it was planned to go. Things happen during the surgery. There's maybe an opportunity to do something else, to secure something else, perhaps that will come, a, come, become evident during that surgical procedure and it's not uncommon from the surgeon to say hey we were doing this but we actually did that because that's also been really helpful and that should be good and they will debrief you in your appointment after you've had the surgery to let you know how everything's gone and it's in that moment that you can get the best possible guidance and understanding of how things are going to move forwards over the coming couple of days weeks and beyond it's such a vital point and quite often people are understandably you coming out of anesthetic you know you're, you're in a different place etc you 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 can be tempted to not ask the necessary questions, which is why we say both in the consultation before you have surgery, maybe it's even two months out and you're having that first discussion about it. And then in the, com in the conversation, importantly, immediately after your surgery, you ask the nine questions that we lay out in the article. And these are simple questions. You know, it's a case of when will I be cleared to get up out of a chair? When will I be able to go back to work? When will I be able to get out of bed? When am I going to be able to walk again? Those simple questions help you get a framework for how you're going to move forwards. And the reason we ask those specific daily life activities is because saying to your your surgeon right after the appointment, when am I going to be able to get back to exercise again, is a useless question because that surgeon, you, a different surgeon, a different doctor, a different physio, whoever it is, will all have different concepts in their mind of what constitutes exercise and what they think constitutes exercise for a patient. And there's marathons on the one end and there's a simple core engagement on the other. And therefore, asking the questions such as sitting, asking the questions such as going upstairs, asking the questions such as, I've got grandkids kids or kids that I've got to take care of. When am I going to be able to pick them up? They weigh about this much. Those sorts of questions give you much more usable information in terms of how you can move forwards. And then we can take those activities and compare them to exercises, which is kind of what we're going to do in the second half of today's episode. And we do in detail in the article as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of guidance on understanding at the point of surgery and immediately afterwards, what you need to be asking and having those questions written down. Don't feel bad. When we do consultations all the time and when we've done them in clinic, it's always helpful if a person has a succinct list of questions or comments that they can refer to. Number one, it means that things are very organized when we're delivering information. And number two, 
nothing gets missed out or things don't get missed out because the person's perhaps been thinking about these this list over a couple of days or a couple of weeks before they've come in for the consultation. And also it helps you prevent the feeling of getting out, getting home and going, oh gosh, I should have asked that question. So write it down. It's not a problem if someone pulls out a list. Sure, if it's, you know, five sides of A4, then we might have an issue. And maybe, we, maybe we're, we're wondering, are we going for the right procedure? Because we have so many questions that perhaps we haven't explored it beforehand but hopefully you get the point there. Write down some of those simple questions because they will help give you an idea moving forwards from the guy that's or, or lady that's done the operation. They know most in, intimately what's gone on, how good it's been and what the prospective recovery will be from there out. So that's that part. The next part is thinking about your recovery before the surgery. And this is really, really important because ultimately we know you're going to be in pain. We know there's going to, we're going to be, um, you know, bothered by the symptoms. It's going to be limiting our daily life. But the reality is, yes, there are some emergency surgeries and you don't really have a choice in those fundamentally. You know, you go in, oh my gosh, there's a red flag. Maybe it's quarter equina. You know, you already have been referred to urgently from the GP or your A&E and you've had to have surgery and you, and you go home. That, those sorts of circumstances are extremely rare. Most of the time we speak to people, um, we spoke to patients over the years and, and members, and it's, I've got a surgery in six weeks, eight weeks, four weeks, whatever the case may be. There's plenty of warning. Or as I mentioned earlier, we get a person who who, who contacts us and says something like, you know, I, I've, um, I'm interested in joining, but I've got a surgery in, in, in eight weeks, so I, I won't do anything just yet. I was just kind of having a chat. And, and that's fine. But the, the simple fact of the matter is you are going about the activities of daily living. You are doing things on a daily basis. You are getting up out of chairs. You are moving around. You are doing whatever it is, albeit with pain, and that's fine. But you are doing all of those things. And as we discussed on last week's podcast on chronic back pain, those are the things that stopped your back pain healing in the first place. Those are the things that are going to be barriers post-op. And all the while, you're going to be continuing the bad habits, which you're going to have to unlearn, otherwise there will be a problem post-surgery. And you're going to be deconditioning that whole time as well, which goes back to what we started, what we mentioned at the very start, which is the better conditioning you're in, the best you're going to do. If you're already in pain and you're getting up out of chairs, doing these other activities, you know, uh, moving around the house, doing some hoovering, whatever it may be, and just grinning and bearing it through the pain, why would you not do some simplistic resistance exercises? With the example of getting out of the chair, learn to do a squat right. Because at the end of the day, learning the rehab afterwards is, in going, is going to involve trial and error. You evidently, the fact that you have surgery lined up in that sort of manner, it indicates that you have not been moving your body properly over the years. You do not have full um, good movement, range of motion, etc., And you probably have, or no, will certainly have, bad movement practices on a daily basis. Why would you wait to learn to, to, to relearn those things and go through the inevitable trial and error of getting it slightly wrong after the surgery when you could get that out of the way now and improve your success with those activities? Granted, maybe it's two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it is, and you're not going to get things perfect. But the better you are going in, the better you're going to be coming out and the less trial and error you're going to have to have. For example, if you struggle even to do a simple core engagement, maybe a psoas engagement that we discussed earlier, which is whereby we should, uh, which we will discuss in a moment, um, which is whereby we stabilize our spine and initiate movement from the leg. If you can't even control that movement and it's aggravating you and the spine's moving, then you're going to have to learn that after, after surgery as well. You're already going to be doing things like putting your socks on, putting your shoes on. You're going to be getting out of bed in the morning, which involves movement of the spine. You may as well learn it beforehand or start the process of learning it beforehand so that you minimize the amount of errors and the gravity of those errors after surgery. Yes, many of you will hopefully be prescribed some sort of exercise or some sort of support for physio, but it's not there every day. You're going to have to do the learning and you have to do it on your own unless you've got some sort of support. But it's helpful if you learn it long before you have the surgery so you can get some of those early silly mistakes out of the way, start reflecting on these things. And as I said earlier, you're moving around living life anyway. It's not like you're doing nothing all day. You will be doing something. And if you are doing nothing, that's a whole host of other problems. And the very fact that the surgery is not an emergency and hasn't already been done and has been scheduled for a number of weeks out indicates that the, the medical professionals that have evaluated you think that the activities of daily living are not sufficiently challenging to warrant an emergency surgery or the case isn't bad enough to warrant an emergency surgery. So know that you may as well use that time, seeing as you're doing some stuff, to actually do something that is going to be purposeful and helpful. And that's really important. 
hopefully that message hasn't been labored. It is so vital and so many people just don't think about it like that, that it really needs to be got across. The next part is talking about the actual surgery itself. Know that surgery involves healing. There is tissue damage. It will be a greater degree depending on which type of surgery you have. Some will inv have involved uh, a, a couple of days overnight in hospital. Others you'll be going out pretty quickly. But know that there has been tissue damage in, in regards to doing the surgery involves a degree of tissue damage, sometimes more, sometimes less. And this is your opportunity now for healing. Granted, new injuries like that are gonna heal a lot better. Maybe you've had some stitches or some other bits and pieces, so that's gonna help the healing process. But this is your golden opportunity to go through the healing process correctly this time round, rather than as previous episodes have occurred, we haven't done the right sort of exercises. A big, a big one here is doing things like knee hugs, pulling things apart after an injury has, has, has occurred. So when you've had your surgery, get in your mind, it's not that everything should go away. Granted, they might have chopped away a bit of disc or shaved off some bone that has alleviated immediate pressure on a nerve, let's say, but there is tissue damage there still, and that needs to go through that healing process. So don't be alarmed if there's a little bit of soreness. You'll have been um, likely given some painkillers. You might have had a, a, a local uh, injection of something like steroids to reduce the inflammation in that area or to help. But know that that area is vulnerable. It is not um, as healthy and as well as everything else because it has just been through that procedure, which hasn't been taken lightly. So be cautious with these sorts of things. And this again comes back. It always ties back to the things you're doing on a daily basis. We'll be incredibly worried about doing anything like um, ex in the way of exercise or specific exercise, but we've got no problem putting our trousers on. We don't think of that as being a problem, although it might be uncomfortable. But it's those sorts of things that we really need to think about. What am I doing as I'm doing these sorts of activities? And, and if I'm willing to do those activities, why not do some activities that have a benefit to my recovery process? So just think about that. Be patient as well. Your body will go through a natural healing process of its own accord. The skin on the surface of where the wound has been done and maybe um, tied up back together again nicely or if it's keyhole surgery, very minimally, is going to heal very, very quickly. The muscular layers that maybe have been interfered with, they're also going to heal remarkably quickly. The, then we get into some of the ligamentous tissue where maybe the disc has been shaved off or that site where it's been shaved down. That, that is not normal disc tissue now. That needs to go through a healing process. The nerves may have been bumped a little bit, giving a little bit of uh, tingling that can sometimes occur after surgery. That needs to go through a healing process. And all of these have perfect capacity. So we're not saying this to scare you. We're saying this to, uh, to make you aware of these things so that there's not the expectation that everything's gonna be okay and we've fixed an underlying problem. There is still weakness that is present and tissues that need to heal and they will go through that process more or less normally um, providing we use this opportunity to do the right sort of things. So that really brings me on to really three stages of rehab. We've got that early rehab, which we'll go through first, then mid, and then long, long-term long rehabilitation. And when it comes to the early rehabilitation, it's, it's very important that we keep things relatively mobile. After the surgery, you'll be advised of this to reduce the risk of likelihood of things like DVT, et cetera. And, and we want to also prevent the soft tissues that have been interrupted adhering to one another and getting these adhesions between the soft tissue layers. And that's why keeping moving is going to be helpful. So you'll be advised to do small amounts of walking. That doesn't mean you're going on a 10K hike. That means small walking, regular movement around the house and not being still for too long. That allows these tissues to start to glide over one another again and prevent any stickiness between the layers of tissue. So very, very important. But walking is being upright. It's moving around. It's doing things around the house that you are able to do. So just Bear in mind, you cleared to do that after surgery, and that's an important um, acknowledgement. Now, then we come to exercises that are commonly prescribed that we really don't agree with, and that's things like knee hugs. Now, why is the, the walking okay, but knee hugs not? Walking involves, if we imagine these are the two spinal joints and we've got a disc in between, walking you're gonna get small undulations, small amounts of movement. If, if we example my neck, it's small left and right. Those little bits of movement move the soft tissues, stretch the soft tissues, uh, contract the soft tissues to allow them to glide over one another, preventing that adhesion. If we start doing extreme movements one way or other, then we start to get to the point where we start to maximally stretch and pull on soft tissues. And those are the soft tissues that are trying to knit back together post-surgery, maybe with a little bit of aid. There is no sense in doing those sorts of full range of motion exercises at this early stage. And quite frankly, they're prescribed just as nonchalantly as they were when you first injured their back. There's not really the thought that goes into them. It's just do these knee hugs because it'll keep everything moving. That's not really a good enough approach and it doesn't 
makes sense if we explore the structure of the lower back, etc., and the things that we need to try and restore. If you've just had a disc problem, a disc, um, a bit of disc shaved off because there's some degenerative change there or some bulge there, um, and you're going straight back to forward bending exercises, knowing that it was likely forward bending exercises that caused the problem, it's just not a good idea. And we've got plenty of episodes of, on the podcast talking about those specific exercises. But the gentle walking is going to be good. And one of the other important exercises or principles you're going to work on is the stabilization of your spine. That is isometric exercises. That is preventing the spine from moving erroneously. And this is a vital skill that often is lacking, which is why we mentioned earlier on that it's so important to learn this skill beforehand because you're probably not very good at it, let alone when you've got some painkillers are still there, so you haven't quite got an awareness of what's going on down there because it's skewed a little bit. Um, and, 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 and learning to do it for the very first time now is not a good idea. And as I said, it's likely to have been a problem for the long term anyway. So getting to grips with these exercises in the safest possible manner is important. Even if you've done a bit of practice beforehand, you're still gonna be a bit rusty after having a surgery, so be careful and cautious. But simple exercises like that psoas engagement are so very safe because you're, you're lying down on your back on the floor. You're engaging your core. We don't have the load of gravity to deal with. And all we're doing is lifting our knee and pressing it into our hand. And what that does is that means that our core musculature has to stabilize our spine so it doesn't move. And then as our leg comes up, it creates a bit of force or a bit of movement from the one hip and not the other. And that can potentially start to destabilize the, the pelvis. By doing it in this environment, the destabilization forces are much, much lesser. We don't have gravity to deal with, it's one leg, we can do it very, very gently, maybe even just the initiation of movement. But we're doing it in such a thoughtful way for that 10 reps that we're doing it, we're lying down, we're focused 100%, maybe we're on the bed still doing this, maybe we're on the floor if we can, and we're really focusing on doing it, and doing it well so the spine doesn't move. And that is building the early parts of spinal stability. To be concerned about doing that, when you've probably been cleared for getting in the car to go home after surgery, well, getting in and out of a car, as many of you will know, was, is vastly more strenuous than what I've just discussed, yet the surgeon has sent you home to do that. Bear that in mind. You're probably putting your shoes, socks, trousers, whatever it is, on every day, which involves significantly more movement, and you're sat up, by the way, you're not lying down, and maybe you're lying down doing it, but there's a lot more movement going on. Start to think about these things, and don't be so scared about doing exercises if you are already doing all of those other things, because those are the things that are gonna give you a flare up. Those are the things that are gonna get in the way if you don't do them properly. Learning to stabilize your spine in a safe, controlled environment with guidance is really so much lower risk, and there's actually a reward the other side. Now we could make the argument that getting dressed has a reward that you're not walking around the house naked, but doing this helps you start to complement the recovery process properly. And then we could take that a little step further. We could look at an exercise like a dead bug where we're lying on our back and there's a little bit more movement happening. Then the same thing, we're learning to stabilize our spine. And then we take it one step further and we consider the squat. Now you might be thinking, God, Mike, a squat now? I've just had surgery, I can't do that. Did you get out of the car? Did you get out of the hospital bed? Did you get into bed? this evening, you're getting into a chair every day. M make no mistake about it. So to be concerned, no, you're not doing a 100 kilo squat, but simply practicing the movement of squatting with good form, thinking about those training points. We should have done it before surgery, but doing it afterwards, because you're doing those squats anyway, you're getting out of chairs anyway, so you need to learn to do it in a way that is going to be safe as possible for your spine. and. As you're being, you know, your other half's calling through to you from the root, from the other room, as you're going to get out of the chair, you're probably not focusing on your squat form, but you can focus on your squat form when you've got a dedicated time. Maybe they're even watching. Maybe you're doing it in front of a mirror. Maybe you're recording yourself because you're taking this seriously this time around. That is going to help you make recovery because you'll start to learn the practices of good movement. And those will then move across to the things you're doing on a daily basis when you're getting up and down off the toilet seat, getting out of bed in the morning, all these other sorts of activities will be benefited by you devoting that time. Hey, most of the time you've got a bit of time off work after this, so what, what else are you doing if you're not going to be doing this and working seriously on this? You know, People don't make the decision to have surgery lightly, so we shouldn't make the decision to, to not do our rehab either. Very, very important. So you'll notice how we're trying to tie these activities to things that you have been cleared of, those nine questions we mentioned earlier on, because we know we've been cleared for those things. So thereby, by virtue, obviously we have to scale the exercise, so scale the squat so it is, so it is relevant to. So if you're doing um, body weight, you're getting out of a chair, 
yourself with just your body weight, then a squat with just your body weight through a limited range of motion that you can control is gonna be good. We're not saying you've been cleared to get out of a chair, so go and pick up a 15, 20 kilo dumbbell and do squats as well. That's not smart and that's not what we're saying. So it has to be proportional and comparable. But if it is comparable, why would we not do the one that has the benefit, but do the other poorly, which is likely going to be disrupting our healing process, as we mentioned in the last episode on chronic back pain. So that brings us to the mid-stage rehab. And this is where we're kind of starting to do some more complex activities. And the example here is going up the stairs. What's happening when you go up the stairs incorrectly? If you've been cleared to go up the stairs after maybe two or three days, maybe your house is, is, is in a place where you have to go upstairs. Maybe your certain aspects of coming out of the hospital or going through the hospital involved you going upstairs. Hopefully you got a lift, but it, it may well involve you going upstairs. What happens when we go upstairs? Let's explore that for a moment. You put weight through one leg, and then let's explore it going wrong. You don't have the strength and control over that leg. So the knee wobbles and rotates in a little bit. That puts a twisting movement through your thigh. That twisting movement through your thigh pulls on your hip and it tilts your pelvis. As your pelvis tilts, it puts asymmetric strain through your L45 and L5S1 segments, the segments that have most likely had the surgery on them. And as you do that, you tilt and side bend a little bit. So you load more through one side than the other perhaps. And then your rib cage moves off to the side a little bit, shunting your center of mass to the one side. And then you also also lean forwards as you would do when you're going up a chair. So at the same time as, the, uh, uh, sorry, as you're going up a stairs. So at the same time you're doing that, your back rounds a little bit. You can see how this is a problem, right? And it's just going up the stairs. So that is an over-exaggeration, but those little levers, little movements happen on a micro level and they're all coming together. So this is why we talk about the reverse lunge. Why is the reverse lunge so good? Because the reverse lunge can be such a small range of motion, it seems almost pointless, but it's so very safe that you are in control the whole way through. You're not doing a forward lunge where there's the impact in having to step and decelerate. You're doing a backward lunge. So you've got the foot firmly planted and then you're slowly lowering backwards and then coming up. And we can do this with, you know, even a 10 or 15 degree bend at the knee, hardly anything at all to start with, much less certainly than going up a step. But it teaches you to start to stop all of those things I just mentioned happening. It teaches you to be connected with the ground, hold the knee steady, engaging some of the leg musculature to support the limb as it's coming up, holding the pelvis steady as you drive through that one limb, and then holding the spine steady as that all happens, and the torso and the head up top, all in good alignment with support and protection from the muscles, muscles of the lower back, the core, and everywhere else. And see how this is very similar to that early exercise the, the psoas engagement. Because in that exercise, we had our spine stable, and then we had a destabilizing force on one side of the body coming up, which we dealt with off weight bearing. And the natural progression here is now doing it on, bear, on weight bearing, where we have gravity to also deal with. But you see how very safe it is and how very similar it is to the activity that you've been cleared for. And yes, again, reverse lunges can be enhanced into split squats. We can add weights, we can add bands, we can do you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 or more kilos on us, but we can also do nothing. And we can also do a slight bend in the knee to start to learn to do this. And we can also do it thoughtfully in front of a mirror. We can also do it thoughtfully recording ourselves on week one, week two, week three, week four, and slowly going lower and lower and lower and lower, ensuring good, competent form. This makes complete sense because again, you're already been cleared to go up the stairs. You're already cleared to do these sorts of movements. It's just important that you compare and contrast again the activity you're cleared for with the range of motion that you're gonna do on the movement and know that as you're going upstairs and the dog's barking outside and the kids are playing around upstairs or whatever, you're distracted while you're doing this particular movement. But it does have implications on the back. When, you're, when you've got your specific time, 10, 15, 20 minutes to work on this particular movement and the technique, you're not distracted. You're 100% focused. You're maybe even recording yourself for reflection. You can get it right and it's the safest possible environment to start to incorporate these movements. It might sound like we're taking things a bit over the top, but this is often the case that you were so very nervous beforehand, you didn't want to do rehab, yet we were going through all of these activities. And when we have something like back surgery, or even if you have back pain, it's painful. It interrupts everything we do. Why would we not go through the recovery process in a very thoughtful, reflective manner, trying to evaluate our progress as we go along in a sensible way? This is what gets results rather than going through it in such a haphazard way. Oh, well, I'll only turn up to the physio appointment. I'll go through it and then I'll go home and whatever happens, happens. And, and then we end up back to square one, back in the office of whoever it is saying, hey, yeah, it worked for a while, but now my back pain's back. That's not, that's not back pain. That, that's, that's, you haven't done the work properly and you haven't taken it seriously. And that is a bit of a go because people sometimes don't do these things properly. And 
you're throwing away a golden opportunity to make some real change here if we just treat these things right. And you don't have to learn these things alone. You'll probably have some physio support. We've got members in the group, in, in the Back in Shape program, that have much, much more support. You can upload videos. We talk about it all the time on our live Q&As, on our live coaching calls every week, and in the group, to say, upload your videos, check the form as you're going along. It makes a massive difference. Take the videos yourself or do it in front of a mirror. That way we can learn to do these things safely. And then that brings us to the advanced section. Some people think, think, hey, you know, I don't need to do the advanced stuff because I don't need to do any of that sort of stuff. The reality is, you're probably gonna go on holiday, you might have kids, grandkids that are going to want to be picked up. You might have a pot in the garden that needs to be moved. You might have the shopping that needs to be carried. All of these things weigh stuff. Some of them, five, 10 kilos. Some of them, 10, 15, 20, 25 kilos. In the case of going on holiday, yes, you're carrying the suitcase, but you probably also got a rucksack on. You might have a child under one arm as well. It's a lot of weight. And we must then, the final step of this rehab, because our back will have healed by then, the surgical sites will have healed by that point. They will be undergoing remodeling. The remodeling of those tissues is how they change and evolve. And to a certain degree, this is happening throughout your body, irrespective of surgery. And it's happening to all of us all the time. Our body is remodeling based on the stimulus that is put through us. If we put more load through the spine, the body will strengthen. If we put too much load in one instance, then it will fail. And that's what happens sometimes and causes us an injury. But when we're doing our rehab, we do those same movements, that same lunge, that same squat. Those are the movements that we can scale with the addition of resistance, load, and weight over the long term to start to guide those disc fibers, to guide those ligaments in our back, to guide the muscles that support us, to build more and more strength. And all that's happening here is we're taking those same exercises, increasing the resistance, making sure the form is retained throughout, because there's no good you add resistance and the form goes out the window, then we're creating problems. But we're doing that so that on the one hand, we have our body's tolerance for doing work. And this might be a squat with load. It might be a split squat with load. And that is increasing. And then we have the likelihood of activities coming on our daily base, in our daily basis of, of, of you know, the way in which we live our lives that exceed that load. And every now and then it will exceed the load. But the more capacity we rebuild, the stronger our body will be after the surgery, that we'll be able to do these sorts of things again with success and without feeling vulnerable. But it takes time. The remodeling side of things, the, the long-term strategy means that you take on board what's been, take on board the knowledge that the reason the back was bad in the first place, the reason the back even warranted surgery long before it warranted surgery was because we haven't looked after our body properly. We haven't done the appropriate resistance training over the years. We haven't incorporated at this late stage the, the flexibility component because now we've built strength. We also need to have good flexibility and good range of motion. So we should be working on that at this stage as well. And that we actually really need to do that stuff if we're going to be healthy and well for the long term and able to do the things we want to do. So it might sound like a bit of a, a, bit of a chore, but working out for three, four or five times a week for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe even an hour, some of you might really enjoy it, is really not too much to ask when there are 168 hours a week. You can devote this after your surgery to keeping your body in good condition, building up a tolerance, building up that safety net so that you are stronger and more capable of going through life and all the things that you want to do, enjoy to do on a daily basis without them posing a risk, a threatening risk to destabilizing your back and re-injuring things. Those of you that have had more minor surgeries, maybe it's a disectomy, it's not been that invasive, you know, you will most likely be able to get back to all the things you want to do. And there's going to be minimal long lasting disruption in that area, let's say. Whereas someone else who's had some bolts put in for whatever the case may be, there's some fusions that have been taking place in that lower back, that's more invasive. For those of you, you're gonna really need to work on offsetting that structural change by providing greater than average muscular support in, the, in and around the lower back and the legs. Flexibility of the hips, because that flexibility of the hips will allow you to use the hips more so the lower back has to get involved less, because remember we've got le a, less, a fewer number of joints in that lower back to share the movement. And as long as we do that for the long term, and we commit to that from this point henceforth, henceforth, we will do very, very well. So I know it's been a longer episode of the podcast this week. I do hope it's been helpful. And that article, if you are someone who's uh, looking at the prospects of surgery or considering it, it's on the cards, or you've had it, I would really encourage you to check out the full article as well, because it goes through some other areas too, which will hopefully be really helpful for you. There's obviously that comment section, as we already mentioned, but I'll leave you with this. If you're someone that's potentially got surgery on the cards and you haven't had it yet, and maybe you're despondent, you've done exercise before, it hasn't worked, 
have they have the exercises you've tried adhered to the principles we discuss here and have you given them the appropriate amount of time care and attention required for them to be successful because exercises don't make a difference overnight adaptive change in the body takes time and it requires consistency over months and longer this if you start doing that now you'll at least give yourself the opportunity to see some change before that surgical date and then you might join the ranks of people who've said hey i've got the surgery booked and actually i don't need it anymore i'm seeing things going in the right sort of direction for the first time in a long time. And actually, I'll just push back the date on that surgery. Let's push it back another six to 12 weeks and see where I'm at then. And maybe then I don't even need it. Or if you're someone that's had surgery, use this as your golden chance. Use this as your opportunity to heal right this time, to go through the right sort of rehab, take it seriously, spend and invest the time now to get those foundations in that early stage right, get the mid stage down, and then commit to doing that advanced stage of work for the long term. It will allow you to get back to doing all the things you love and it will maximize your prospects of this being a success in the truest sense of the word. So hopefully today's episode has been helpful for you guys. If you do know someone else who's got a surgery lined up or who's struggling with their lower back and, or maybe he's had, had surgery and they're struggling still, do consider sharing this episode with them. As always, if you did find it helpful, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. We release a new episode every single week. Usually they come out on the Saturday Stroke Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.